Parker is our wonderful moderator. He's the chair of the MFA Theater Program at Columbia. He's a director, a dramaturg, and we actually used to work at Atlantic Theater Company together, so we're thrilled to be back with him. So I'm gonna hand it over to you guys. Thank you so much for being here, and have a blast. All right. uh, thank you, Courtney. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, today moderating this panel. I do a lot of things like this, and I have to say, uh, I was kind of especially daunted by the uh, range of accomplishments of this group of people. Um, most of whom I had not met before, but have admired for a long time. And I think I was actually, as I was walking over here, I was, I was trying to tally it up and I thought, oh yeah, no, actually I have taught all of your work, or in fact with Anne, I have taught with Anne, but I have taught all of your work in some way uh, in my classes, uh, not to mention having admired it for so long. So it's really amazing for me to also be able to talk to all of you uh, today. Obviously this is, the, the theme of this week is called Identity Week, and this panel, when presented to me, um, uh, when, they, when Courtney and uh, Ryan came to me and asked me to moderate, uh, they said, well, this is, a, this is a pioneer panel. These are all pioneers in the field. And so you know, that's sort of the unifying idea of this, of this particular evening. Um, and I thought, well, what an interesting moniker to be saddled with uh, as, a, as an artist, actually. Because um, I'm not sure what, I'm not, I, my first question I think to the panel and, and to myself when I heard that would be, what does it mean to be saddled with the moniker pioneer? When you think about, about any of your careers and you look back uh, and someone tells you you're a pioneer, you're on a pioneer panel, uh, what, is, what did you pioneer, what, what, when you think over your own work, what, um, what would you like to think of as having pioneered? <laughs> or not? <laughs> what does that mean to you, that term? Any, any of you have something spring to mind? Larry, you're the biggest pioneer. <laughs> Come on. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think that way. I, um, uh, what are you writing about? What's meaningful to you? How do you get it out there, day at a time? Um, it's all hard. <laughs> and uh, I think I don't. I don't know. I, don't, I never thought of myself as a pioneer. I don't think I've, in many ways, I don't think I've succeeded because the things I fought for are still such a fucking mess. So um, that's what happens when you get old and you and you look back and you say. Okay, what did you accomplish? So. You know, you know I've, I've, you, I met you tonight for the first time and I've admired you for so many years, and, uh, but your reputation is being ornery. And I think that maybe you are a pioneer of the ornery. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody says, you know, you bristle at everything. I'm angry. I don't know about ornery. I think anger is a very healthy emotion. Um, it's never taught that way, but I, I think it's a very valuable emotion to have, to nurture, and to learn how to express. And fortunately, we all have here have the ability to take words and pictures and images and and channel our, our whatever, in my case, anger into actuality. I think pioneer is something other people cause. Yeah. yeah, that's sort of why I raised the question. I, I don't yeah. think we think of ourselves as pioneers. Um, I think Larry was right when he says you write what you write, and you do what you do day by day, and you put it out there the best you can. And um, that's what I have to say. Yeah, that makes sense to me. You know, I was on a panel once with um, uh, uh, Molly Smith and uh, T. 
Tina, not Tina Howe, Tina Shakespeare and Company, oh, Tina, Packer. Tina Packer. And I realized that um, all three of us had actually come to the front door through the back door. In other words, uh, Tina Packer had been working with the RSC, but it was a boys club. So she went to Western Massachusetts and started a very successful company. Molly studied in DC directing and then went to Juneau, Alaska, where there was no theater, and walked the streets and said, who wants to start a theater, and created a fantastic theater company that was actually about Alaskans. My own way was that I couldn't possibly see a way into the field through the front door. It was, in my mind, it was like the corporate ladder for boys. And so I'm, I also went through the back door and made theater on the streets and in shop windows. And, uh, and, and it was the, uh, we would call that back door downtown. And in a way, all three of us on that particular panel I was on, um, have a good good lives doing things that we actually believe in in the theater because we didn't go the front way and that seems a little bit pioneering like what is a pioneer somebody goes across the the country and there's a lot of bears and lions and <laughs> things like that and it's dangerous <laughs> maybe that's helpful yeah. like what what quite often the front door is not available to many of us so is that i think then you take the uh take the the the, the really beautiful elixir of anger and use it to create and to move forward because good feelings doesn't give you the particular energy or fuel that you need but quite often anger and doing your work no matter what in a kind of in a way that, that is, uh, says, says, fuck you to everybody else. We're just <laughs> going to actually do what we need to do. And that's not usually accepted right away. Mm -hmm. And you, Well, one of the things I think is crucial is a lot of times people saying no to you, people saying no to you culturally yeah. or racially or identity-wise mm -hmm. puts you on a journey where you say yes to yourself and saying yes to yourself is the work you create. So, 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 there you, so you get all these no's, you get yeah. personal no's, yeah. you get structural no's, you get institutional no's. People, are, just a, a lot of people tell you no, yeah. and, and, and you can either let those no's define you, yeah. or you can figure out another way to empower yourself. And I think telling, telling stories or telling your stories is how you empower yourself, which is another way of saying through the back door. Yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, important yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, huh? I, I didn't write a play for one year after, after Clive Barnes and the New York Times panned my first play and closed on opening night. He had that much power over me and it took me a long time to get over it. And you, what a waste of a year. Joy, we but you gave him that power. Hmm? You gave him that power. You know, we do. We all we all give people the power. Right. Some, and <laughs> if we get over it and we go to hell with that. That's boring. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've suffered enough. I've suffered to... enough. And yeah. you know, it's like you know. And then when you reclaim your power, that's when you tell your story. And you did. Right. Right. But but George, I remember the first time I ever met you was at the public, and you were doing uh, the Color Museum. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a conversation with you. I don't know if you remember it. And it was something about anger, too. And it was about. Oh, anger is my most evolved emotion. So it was, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. but it was something about you slid in. And, but I don't remember. What were the circumstances? Because something was happening then. We I have no idea. I mean, but you know, it's, but the first, on, on a very simple, on, on a very simple, idiotic level, the first six years of my life, I grew up in a segregated town. So. So there was a whole structure that said no. no. Yeah. And you know, and, 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 and I went to this uh, uh, black grade school where, where I was empowered and told that I was magical and smart and amazing. So on one level, as, as, the, as everybody was there, so on one level people were telling me I'm magical and then there are these structures that tell me no. And so, and somehow the tension between those two things, I think, helps to create, it's why you create the stories, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know. 
Joy, we were talking uh, earlier just a little bit about how your job differs a little bit from all these guys. And one of the things that you have to tackle relative to this question, relative to this question about pioneering and what that could possibly mean to an individual is that you are responsible for uh, not only preserving the integrity of, a, of, an, of, the, of the estate of someone who has been labeled a pioneer, but also curating how that body of work is actually received and contextualized and defined and redefined in, in the world now for somebody whose point of view on her own work differs often from the way that people tend to define it. Can you talk a little bit about sort of your role in, in, in that? Um, yeah, I'll try to harness it a little bit. <laughs> I could talk to a lot of those pieces. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the literary uh, executor of the estate of Lorraine Hansberry. And um, I have to say a little bit about how I came to have that job. My father, Robert Nimeroff, was married to Lorraine Hansberry and was named her literary executor when she died. And so um, he married my mother when I was a child, and I came to live in Lorraine's home in Croton on Hudson, New York. And it was a house that was filled with her spirit and her work and her file cabinets and everything that she was working on. But mostly it was filled with her spirit. And I remember she was my muse, she still is. And um, I was very deeply influenced by her. I am very deeply influenced by her and her visitation on me. But I was also deeply influenced by my father who was an inc a master curator. And um, I had all kinds of skills as a kid. I have all kinds of skills as an adult. But I wanted to do what he does, never thinking never choosing to do it. <laughs> it sort of happened to me. That's another story, how I came to do what I'm doing now. But anyway, um, taking on that responsibility was and is an act of love and commitment. And so um, it's also an act of stewardship and um, protecting and um, protecting in a maternal, in a female sense. Um, so to me, um, it's something that I think about all the time um, as something that you have to be very careful of uh, how you go about doing that and the responsibility. Um, But I wanted to come back to something that Ntosaki said before, because I think, um, especially with Lorraine, Lorraine's thought of, I mean, this, she's not usually thought of as a pioneer, but she's thought of as kind of a matriarch. Uh -huh. You know, she's the mother. <laughs> so um, that's always been very strange to me. It's very strange and awkward for me, because to me, she's sort of like the eternal kid. She was youthful, she's still youthful, she'll always be youthful. Her voice was about being in her 20s, being on the verge of her life, taking off, um, sort of being a, uh, a radical, being a runaway, being, um, being um, on fire. And that's how I think of her. And I think that's really what her plays are about. But part of what we were talking about, which is something I talk about all the time with people, um, is the stories that I love to tell that I find that are most fascinating about Lorraine's um, relationship to this albatross around her neck, which is a raisin in the sun, which was a play that um, was sort of a, it was sort of an assignment for her. It was the first place that she wrote. It was the first, uh, Play, you know, you, you all know what it came to be. But she uh, thought the play was flawed. She thought it was sort of her first try. 
and she was sort of in this impossible situation where it had all this attention, it had all this acclaim, it had all this um, investment, and I don't just mean the financial, I mean the psychological, I mean the psychic, I mean the racial, the, I mean everything. It had to be all of these things. And she was the first person to get online to, to, to critique that, to talk about that, to kind of interrogate it, take it apart. Um, so um, I think a big part of what I take on, because that speaks to me. It speaks to me as an artist. It speaks to me um, as a culture maker that um, there's something very important about that critical role of art and of artists to, um, you know, to, to interrogate themselves and their work and their aspirations and, and to see um, our work as attempts, you know, not as masterpieces or commodities or products, but as sketches. You know, which is what I love about visual artists. You know, that whole idea of like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint this today. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try it today. I'm gonna see how, I, and, I, and I'm gonna have the, the the courage and the nerve to hate it tomorrow right. or tear it up. Or um, I, I wonder, if, like, what happens when when you sort of add that energy to to I think the context that we are in right now, which is a very angry time. To pick up on your idea about you know your thoughts about anger. And what you were saying, Anne, like we're in, we're in, a, what I would describe as a very angry moment uh, in our cultural history, um, and it, it exists in different pockets of the population in different ways. Uh, Let's but, talk about why the theater isn't really attending to it. Well, and that was my question, which is, what, where does that leave you guys as artists, and where does that leave the theater as a possible way to filter, uh, speak to that, you know what? What are your thoughts on that, Larry? Um, I don't like most of the things that I see or read about now. I think I'm not talking. I'm talking about white writers. I'm not talking about people of color who seem to be having a good a good moment to be more front and center than they have been. But I think that uh, that everything that most of us are asked to see is what I call small, and there's there's no Bert Lahr, the famous comedian. He was asked to describe what he thought theater was, and uh, he said, "Astonish me." <laughs> and I don't see that. I just see a lot of small plays about people in unhappy situations with their husbands, with their wives, with whatever. And uh, I don't come away with it having learned anything I didn't know or challenged in any way. Um, it's a terrible place, the world. You know, where are our Greek tragedi tra tra tragedy writers? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see them, and I don't hear them. Yeah. I go to see the things that people say I'm supposed to see, and, and uh, I've actually stopped that. And they, you know, they win the Pulitzers or they win the, the whatever, the Tonys. So um, I don't know what hope the theater has for, for changing the world the way that maybe it did for the Greeks. I don't know. I, I, th I think the theater is probably the most important art form right now. Po that possibly exists, and, and I'll tell you why. Because the subject of the theater and what distinguishes it from any other art form is it always asks the question, how are we getting along? And how can we get along better? 
And if, you th and if you think of any play, and I think the reason why plays are about you and me and our apartment and our problems has to do with the political movement between 1948 and 1952 yeah. called the McCarthy era. That's a whole other subject. <laughs> but, and I think it's coming out of there. I think there are plays that are actually dealing with bigger subjects. And, and, and I think that it's no coincidence that, that abstract expressionism was born at the same time as the McCarthy era. Like, what does that mean? Abstract expressionism means it's ab abstracted. But I do think there is a movement towards theater that addresses bigger issues. But going back to the issue of how are we getting along, every, I think, human, we see plays on, in two ways. One, you see a play and you see it in the prefrontal cortex of your brain where you go, Oh, it's a story about, let's pick up the, the Greeks, it's a story about a man who sleeps with his mother and kills his father, and the whole Thebes is really screwed up, and it's a story of a group, a community that's trying to come to a state of balance from a state of imbalance in a crime, right? So that's great, and so that's about that social system. But there's a whole other play that's going on in the theater at the same time, and it's not happening in film, it's happening in the theater, where the audience gets it on an on a older part of the brain, where you're actually seeing how these people on stage are getting along. Like, have you ever gone to a play and like somebody, an actor drops you know, a glass and it breaks and everybody doesn't but know what I to do? if I don't care about There's, what they care about, if I don't care how they get along. Uh, that that on, a, on, a, and on, a, on, a, uh, on a on a subconscious level or a, a different place, the audience goes away taking in who these people are on stage and how they're getting along. But not only that, how's the audience getting along? How are the actors getting along with the audience? That every question is about that. You know, when I saw Shuffle Along, I think George is tired of me telling him how much I love Shuffle Along. But one of the reasons was that, <laughs> was that it, it dealt with history. It dealt with stories of particular people and their problems and, and their issues. But also, the community on the stage was mind-blowing. Like, how those people were together made me want to actually uh, live differently with other people I live with. So I think our job is to propose new social systems. So right now, we're living in a dark period, which is new guided by, by mm -hmm. fear and, uh, and, and paranoia. That's, that's being encouraged by, we won't get there, go there, you know where it's yeah, coming yeah. from. But the theater's job is to propose alternate social systems that might, uh, that translate the break, and, and then I'll shut up, I promise, <laughs> this is a short <laughs> panel, that, that translate the breakthroughs in science, in the arts, in technology, and, tr and, and proposes ways that human beings can actually behave vis-a-vis -vis these changes. Okay. And that's done by the playwrights who describe systems right. of being that's different, and it's done by companies who actually perform differently. Yeah. I'll shut up. Well, I but I just think it's I so wanna, important well, now, I want to pick right up now. on what you just said and what you just said. And, and right before, before this began, I was talking to Dr. Shange and, real, and learned that she had just started a new play for the first time in a really long time. So it's something you're choosing actively to do, which is really exciting for the rest of us. But, so, but you made a very specific choice to do that at this moment. Yes. Can you talk about that? Yes. Um, I hadn't written a play in a very long time because I decided <clears throat> I liked working by myself better than working with a lot of people <laughs> and hearing all their ideas. When I had an idea of my own that I wanted to do, and I didn't want any comments about it. <laughs> and so in order to do that, I didn't write plays, because that would demand that I interact with people. <laughs> and so I haven't written one. And I just finished a new volume of poetry that will be out hopefully next year. And I finished a book of essays. And I worked on a choreo poem that's like ready to go into production. And I worked on that all last year. And I directed it once. I was in it both times. So I was being an actress and a director. And I, I this year when I got ready to write again, I started writing with poems because I haven't been able to use my hands for five years. So I was a, a writer or less writer. And 
when I started able to use my hands again, I started writing poems. And they just came to me naturally. And I, and I was writing these poems. And then it occurred to me that in the revamping of a photograph, which is a play that is 30 years old, that was the first play that I ever tried to write that was severely flawed because I didn't know how to write plays, I knew how to write poems. Mm -hmm. And so I took a photograph and I revamped it, I rewrote it. Mm -hmm. And in the process of rewriting it, my sister, the writer, Papa Isa, said to me, you know, this is your only dialogue-driven play that you've got. And I said, really? It's the only one? And she said, yes, everything else is, has poems in it. And I said, well, Mother Courage did. And she said, well, you didn't write Mother Courage. <laughs> <laughs> and so this time around, after I finished the poem for the new book, I was sitting up and I said, my God, maybe I can think of characters like I do for a novel, I can think of them for the stage. And I can think of a plot like I think of for the novel and condense it so it'll fit into two hours. <laughs> and maybe I can make them talk in a way that exposes all their flaws and desires <laughs> and angers and wants. <laughs> and maybe if I could do that, I'll have a play that's dialogue driven. <laughs> And so I started trying to do that, and I've got two scenes done now. And, I, and I'm very happy. My only problem is that initially I had a play with seven characters, and I was told by theater people that nowadays producers only want to pay for five actors, and they would prefer a two-character play to a five act, to a seven actor play. So I should be mindful of how many characters I need. And couldn't I condense a couple of those characters into one person and all of this? So that was another stymieing point. Because in a novel, I can have as many characters as I want. <laughs> No, I didn't. I wrote five. <laughs> I because I want it produced. No, I. <laughs> I think what kills the theater is two character plays yeah. and monologues. So boring. If I see a two. Monologues are not boring. <laughs> <laughs> when there are only two people on the stage, and you know there are only two actors to play, and I know no one else is coming on. I'm, I've lost interest. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> One of the things that I, I, uh, I you know, I, I wonder about, to sort of expand on this a little bit, is, is, is to, you know, in addition to a context of, of uh, sort of anger, I feel like one of the things that's happening in the culture right now is that we have a, a blurring of, of the lines of uh, between truth and fact, and truth and fiction, in our daily lives, and I think people are confused about what's true and what's real, um, and what they can believe in the media, in particular, and from politicians, in a way that that is different from any any time that I remember in my life. And I wonder, I wonder if you think that that's true, first of all, and I wonder if you think that um, that that being an artist in the theater, which traffics in fiction, fictions for the most part, or ver or versions of reality, is 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 does that marginalize the theater further? That we're in this moment where now we don't even really know, you know, that that the idea that the theater might re reveal certain truths, does that does that resonate? Does that does that That's, even you're resonate? getting too highfalutin. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm trying to locate it in like why you would choose to do what you do. Well, you know, you keep you keep working, all of you. Because so. you care about something. Yeah. Right. I, I get nervous when I hear this word art, and uh, I don't think of myself as an artist. I think of myself as a writer. I don't know what art is. 
you know, all the things you mentioned about what's wrong with the world and what's true and not true. Great plays are written like that, yeah. about people like that. Yeah. And the world isn't, I mean, theater isn't any, any different for, than it's been in terms of, of the themes that are available to them. But I think one of the things that makes theater or poetry valuable or visual art valuable is that something that Anne was talking about, about the, the lower parts of the brain. Because if we can make characters whose reality is so tangible and pungent that it becomes close and dear to the audience, then I think we've done our job. To me, that's the big major thing I want to do. I want to open a person, a character up so much that the audience feels as though they're walking in that person's life or in that person's shoes. And that's, that's what's real to me. It's also, but so much of what, you know, so much of what you're talking about is about stripping away people's sense of power. And so I think the reason why people create, I, I, you know, I think that what it's about is creating work that will give, that will, people come into the theater and they're coming in with varying degrees of I know who I am or I, I don't know what I have or I don't know what I'm holding on to or I don't know what I believe and I don't know what's going on. And everybody's walking around like that. Yeah. And to me, I think one of the core responsibilities, even, even if it's stripping down a human being, is about empowering an audience. Mm -hmm. So it's restoring inside of an audience the sense that they have in, within them an invincible power to change the world. Mm -hmm. We know that changing the world is a monstrously hard, close to impossible thing to do, but I think it's deeply, crucially important yeah. that we all believe that we can. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that theater can do, that the yeah. intimacy of the event the intimacy, you know, to me what's fascinating is when you are watching a film and it has tremendous power, you lean back in your seat. Yeah. When you are watching a play and it has tremendous power, you lean forward in your seat <laughs> because it's proportionally the same size as you. Yeah. And you're looking in to see how you can get these secrets of how these people are succeeding or failing or believing or not believing. Yeah. And that's what I think it's about. And that's why, you know, that's, that's, why, that's why I agree with you that theater continues to be important. I agree with you that a lot of times it's hard to figure out what the stakes are. Yeah. But ultimately, I think the core stake is about empowering people because so much mm -hmm. that is happening in the world is about taking away their power. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's, that's where I am. And, that's where I am right now, is I'm interested in, you know, stories, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in stories that empower, not necessarily rah, rah, rah empowerment, sure, sure. but, you know, I, it can be fuck that empowerment, or I agree empowerment, or you're completely wrong empowerment. It's just instilling inside of people the ability to, to keep charging forward to no matter in. what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, certainly, Shuffle Along was a, is a really interesting example of that, especially because it is actually a, a piece that from it that from a from an earlier period in, in our history that was forgot. You know, no. and, that, and that there and that so that the act of doing it in and of itself was what you described, but that the piece itself was also this thing that in its moment was incredibly forward thinking. Um, and yet somehow that didn't it, it didn't occur in a cultural moment in which that could get traction, you know, and that that's well, it did and then it didn't. Well, right. It, it, you know, and that's 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 well, track, that's that's attraction. attraction. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, that's, that's yeah, what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you've all, I mean, to sort of just to return to the to the the the, the overarching subject of the week. Um, before we move on, we, we, we should move on soon to to, the, to questions. Yeah, um, you've all you've all of your work has touched on issues of American identity, um, in touching on different groups. Um, but the, large, the overarching questions of what, we, what it means to be American in our time, what our responsibilities are. Um, we have a, I feel like one of the things that's happening is it, it, right now in our society is that people are really interrogating the question of whether, not, not what our shared values are, but actually whether we even have them. 
And I just wonder, as you guys are thinking about doing your own work now, how has your, how has your orientation as an artist towards, um, or as a writer, a director, uh, towards the question of American identity or your own identity changed? Um, in, well, you know, recently? you know, I, it was Gore Vidal who calls us the United States of amnesia. Mm -hmm. and, and in a way, he's right, and yet, we have one of the most extraordinary histories in this country, and we have amazing people who've come, uh, who have who are now dead, and who didn't have, didn't finish their uh, sentences. They had more to say. That's yeah. also why I love shuffle along. Yeah. Uh, and, and that sometimes I think that if the if the theater were a verb, it would be to remember, in the sense of to remember, to put the parts back together again, yeah. and that our job is not so much to invent something new, but is to inhabit those who didn't quite finish saying what they have to say. And there are extraordinary examples uh, of, of, of those extraordinary Americans who, who uh, need to be heard right now. And that's a large part of what I personally do as an artist, is listen to those people. Other thoughts on that question? <laughs> or I will happily, Ant's answer is quite comprehensive. Uh, maybe what we should do is open up to uh, the audience. We've got a few more minutes for questions that you might have. Please speak up if you have uh, questions. So we can all hear you. Scared them into silence. <laughs> <laughs> I also can't see you very well. So yes. I'm so honored to be with all of you. You're definitely heroes. doing and so sort of a two-part question forgive me I know these questions are supposed to be really quick um, uh, how, I don't know if any of you read Helen Shaw's article in American Theater Magazine I can speak okay. a little more loudly yeah, yeah. Uh, Helen Shaw wrote an article I don't know if any of you have read it in the American Theater Magazine this week uh, or last week called The State of the Play in which uh, no offense to uh, our academies on the panel who we talked to but uh, that uh, that perhaps uh, MFA programs and academic institutions have come to displace, uh, have become the watch, what's the phrase? The watchdog. The watch, watch um, the gatekeepers mm -hmm. of, uh, of the American theater. And that it's impossible that somebody like August Wilson or somebody suffering from a mental health issue or someone who's on the outskirts of power would find any way in or that their work would be recognized. And that the only way to make it in or to find one's way in is by uh, becoming more like the academic uh, work that's being done to develop one's aesthetic in that matter. And that, that power sort of works on people, artists individually in the work. Okay. And yeah. so, and, and I'd like to finish by saying, how do we, it, it was an interesting article that raised a lot of big questions about. So, what's your theater. question? And one of the big questions is how do we voice disagreement? How do uh, about things that are going on in the American theater itself and talk about it when we're stuck in a place where uh, we're also having to be extremely professional in our art and the art has become somewhat commercial and we find that we're in a market. Okay, well that's a lot of questions. You had a well, lot of I thoughts. raised my hand because what you okay, so he was asking, I'm going to summarize your question. How do, how, well, he was contextualizing his question about an article that was in American Theater this month, which sort of suggests, I have not read it yet, but which suggests that, that there's a barrier to entry to the profession to anybody who doesn't sort of conform to a kind of work that's being established in MFA programs, whether or not they necessarily go to one, and that it's hard to en enter the profession if you are in some way an outsider. And how do we talk about, as artists and makers, what uh, what the problems of our own industry in terms of access might be um, when we're when our industry has become so commercialized or professionalized. And Is that we're fair? To for our, for our and okay, great. Well, I had qualms about teaching in the creative writing graduate program at the University of Houston because I didn't understand why a poet just couldn't write some poems and go to a reading and read them and have the people respond to them and see how their work was being taken in 
Or if it wasn't being taken in the way they wanted, what could they change to fix it? Because you find out what's wrong with your work when you do it in front of people. And when I was in teaching these people in this MFA program, and they were trying to go ahead and get PhDs in poetry, I was like aghast. And I couldn't understand what I was doing teaching these people. Because I didn't think that they could be taught. What we're trying to do is maybe give you some technical points, but you can't teach somebody how to write a poem. And writing a play is not an exercise that you do in four months and turn it in. I wrote it because I had to write it. It should be a passion in you that drives the coming of the art. I'm sorry, Larry. But the coming of the art should come from a passion that's in you. It can't be an assignment. And that's what I think the NFA programs do to people. They make the art so that it is so dry and, 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 and perfect that there's no room in it for sweat and there's no room in it for tears or laughter. Okay, any other thoughts on, the, on that question here? Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, honored to be, uh, to be here and to listen to the wisdom you shared on the stage. And I'm wondering at this stage in your career, uh, in what way do you mentor uh, emerging artists, writers, um, what are some of your, uh, who are some of your mentees, and how did those relationships develop? The question was uh, up to the whole panel about how they uh, interact with younger artists, how they mentor people, and are there any examples of mentees that they have that they wanted to specifically mention? And I purposely said emerging, not younger. The question was about mentorship, and about any, any younger artists that you find yourself in a position to mentor, and what your position is on, on working with younger artists. And I purposely said emerging, emerging not younger. <coughs> emerging, yes. Right, so it could be emerging at 60. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good, that's a good <laughs> modifier. Sorry about that, yes. You mentor a lot. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Entezaki that you can't teach, I would say I teach directing, but you can't teach it. What you can do is give an opportunity for, uh, for emerging artists to put work in front of an audience. And sometimes the audience, and you have to have an audience, right? Mm -hmm. it, unless you, it's not theoretical. You put it in front of an audience, and then you're embarrassed by what you see, and then you make adjustments from that embarrassment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's true that MFA issue is an issue. And I know, because I work in an MFA program, so I'm one of the guilty people. But, but. Uh, and I always think when I'm, taking, I'm looking at students, I thought I would never get into my program. When I'm, <laughs> uh, anyway, that was, is actually true. I look at their applications and I think, I could never get into the program that I'm running. But, um, and, and, I, and, and, and maybe 10 years ago, I used to always say, don't go to MFA programs, just go do your work. But there is truly uh, an, an, uh, an advantage and perhaps an unfair advantage, I think. But going back to the mentor question, you can give an opportunity to make work, and then you can be truthful about what you experience. And that's called critique. This is what I saw. Why didn't you think of this? But that's about it. I can use myself as a barometer. I actually, in other words, my body gets excited when I'm watching your work. That's a good thing. I got really bored. That's the bad thing. You know? yeah. I think that astonish me is is truly the art of what we're trying to do is is to is to create work that changes the heartbeat, and so I can just be present for uh, for emerging artists and respond because I practiced for many years. Okay. Well, I have. I spoke to one of my mentees today. And she's at the stage where she feels like she needs an agent. And I, I am feeling uneasy about 
introducing her to an agent because I don't think she's ready yet. And I don't quite know how to tell her that she has to write some more and expose herself some more in little magazines and small magazines and small newspapers. She has to put herself out there so that it can be seen so that somebody who is an agent would be taken with it, be smitten by it, and want her. And um, it's, it's, it's almost like the MFA pro question because at a certain stage in our careers, you do need an agent. But the, it, I have always felt like they had to come looking for me because I didn't feel like I was ready yet if they weren't looking for me. And so I'm gonna tell this young woman that tomorrow. But her name is Mariposa Fernandez. I also work with a young woman who goes by the name of Bruja, who's a performing poet. They're both performing poets. And I work with a young woman who's a performing poet and singer who has started her first play. And she's just getting started on it, so I'm being very gentle with her and letting her go wherever she goes. It's sort of wandering right now. That might be the shape of the play. So we'll just have to wait and see. Very generous of you. Uh, we have time for just one or two more. Yes, in the middle. I felt early in the program I heard uh, the instruction, use your anger as sort of a guiding principle for young artists. What instructions would you leave upcoming generations of artists with as speaking from the point of view of successful? What instructions would you offer, folks? Mm -hmm. what, what instructions would you offer to uh, I think there's only one, artists, uh, and I certainly artists. didn't make it up, there's only one, which is be courageous. Uh -huh. That's it. And also, uh, one, of the, one of the things I think is most important is that when you encounter failure, don't like run away from it, but walk through the failure mm -hmm. So you can figure out what you did to contribute to the phenomenon so it doesn't happen again. <laughs> you know? And that that was one of the, the the first play I did in New York got hate, hate reviews. And then the second one went, oh my God, he, where has he been all our lives? And you know, and I'm and I am so glad that it happened in that order. Because I learned so much stuff about what I did, how I was stupid, how I surrendered authority, how I did a bunch of crap that contributed to it not working. So that by the time I did the next play, my next play, I was like, every single antenna on me was so re sharpened and so refined. No, I'm not doing that. No, that's not right. No, we're not doing that. Whereas the first play around, I went, okay, sure, why not? So I think when you encounter failure, failure Failure isn't a punishment. I think failure is an extraordinary opportunity to learn and get smarter and get better. Well, the, the other thing I think is important is to read. I think I find that a lot of, of people who approach me and want to become writers don't read. They don't have any context for what they want to do themselves. They don't know what can influence them or feed them or, or, or anger them or make them cry. And if they don't know what, who can do that to them, how do they know how to do that to somebody else? And, I, and it also increases your vocabulary. It gives you more of an idea of place. It gives you a sense of history. I would just beg all the young artists and emerging artists to read as much as you can of whatever it is. Read science books, read history books, read biographies, read autobiographies, but read. Because there's, there's so much of the world locked up and you have access to it. Great advice. Did you want to add anything, Larry? Did you want to add anything to the laundry list of, uh, of advice to younger artists? <laughs> you 
if you believe enough in your work, keep going. Yeah. It's not easy, but keep going. Um, That's great. I'd, yes. I'd also like to add, um, in addition to reading, um, to, uh, to experience your discomfort, um, to notice what that discomfort brings up. Mm -hmm. Because I think as you read, as you expand, as you grow, you're going to be asked to come out of your comfort level. Mm -hmm. um, which for us culturally is the same thing as saying you're going to have to deal with things that are unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we really suffer. We're in peril now as a society because we're too addicted to comfort. So it's really important to be able to um, not only be uncomfortable, which <laughs> kind of sounds ridiculous, but to notice the purpose of discomfort. What, what can we take which from that? Which sort of comes back yeah, to what yeah. George was just saying. You know, what does discomfort teach you? Mm -hmm. right. Try not to be afraid. Mm -hmm. Try not to be afraid. Um, I'm a late bloomer because, um, like so many people who want to write, uh, they're afraid to actually get down to do it. And then when they actually have something, they're afraid to show it to anybody else. Um, everybody goes through that. So you have to get past all of that. Put that over there on, yeah. the, on the side so of the Look place. at it and then put it over there. Uh, I think that's a really good place for us to end, actually. Um, I want to thank all of you so much for, for being here. <laughs>